Welcome to everyone on the Zoom. We're just gonna wait a couple of minutes for more people to trickle in and then we'll get the program started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming tonight, whether you're joining virtually or in person. It's great to have everyone here. We're really excited for the speakers that will be joining us and all of the information that they'll be providing us tonight. My name is Lucy Mellon. I'm the Sustainability Coordinator for the Village of Wilmette and Wilmette Park District. And I'm joined by Beth Drucker from Go Green Wilmette, who's co-hosting this program with us. Um, we wanted to, to create this program to have a space for Lakeshore Recycling Systems, the Village of Wilmette's new waste hauler, and the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County to be able to come and talk to you about how to dispose of waste properly and also to get any questions you have answered about waste that you maybe have been dying to find out. Um, we're joined tonight by Christina Siebert from the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County, who will be providing us with a broader overview of what Swank does in our communities and, and what uh, the current state of waste disposal in our county is. And then we have Joy Rifkin from Lakeshore Recycling Systems to talk more on a granular level about waste disposal in Wilmette and also in other communities that utilize LRS. And then we'll be giving some brief information about Go Green Wilmette and the role that they have in the community and some other Wilmette specific programs that might be applicable in your community. So I'll pass it off to Beth Drucker from Go Green Wilmette. Thank you. So we're delighted to have both our in-person audience as well as our remote audience. And if you uh, like, if you're interested in this program, you want to watch it again or recommend it to someone else, it is being recorded. It will be posted to Go Green Will Met's YouTube channel tomorrow. So um, Go Green Will Met has been around since 2006. Our mission is to raise environmental awareness, inspire people to take action and create a more sustainable community. We work in all different kinds of areas, but waste reduction is a really important one. And if you're like me, you stand in your kitchen, holding something in your hand and saying, wow, I still don't know, is this recyclable or not? So um, we knew this was an interesting topic. So we got our very best speakers to come to sort things out for you. And so we, um, we will be having Q and A afterwards, but those of you who are, in our virtual audience, please put your questions in the Q&A. Don't put them in the chat. We're monitoring the Q&A. Look at the questions that are already there and you can upvote the questions that you think are most important to you. Thou those questions will rise to the top and we'll get to the most important questions first. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Lucy to start the program. Thank you. Okay, so our first speaker will be Christina Siebert uh, from the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County to give a broader overview about county waste disposal. Thank you, Lucy. So just quickly, some of the things that we will go over tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk about our regional waste and recycling conditions, uh, taking the the regional approach being Northern Cook County. I'll explain a little more about who Swink is. And then I'll be turning it over to Joy and she's going to talk about Wilmette's curbside program and go into more uh, discussion about why recycling matters, what the items are that they typically see being placed in recycling that shouldn't be. And then we'll get into that Q and A. So we're gonna try and get through this pretty quick. So from our presentations, so that we can get to your questions and really fill you in on what you'd like to know tonight. Um, so starting with these regional conditions and a little bit about Swank. Um, Swank is the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County. We are a uh, municipal joint action agency, which is a unit of local government comprised of 23 member communities across Northern Cook County. So we stretch from Barrington on the west all the way across to the North Shore communities here on the east um, and have about 800,000 residents, about 260,000 households that are part of our membership. 
Um, we have a, a, really a two-part mission. Uh, the first part is to provide the long-term cost competitive and environmentally safe and sound disposal of the garbage that is created from our residents. And the second part is to reduce how much waste we are actually disposing and finding methods to divert it responsibly, whether that's diverting to a recycling and composting process or if it's diverting it to a safer disposal method. Some of the materials that we collect and manage are not really meant to be recycled, things like household hazardous waste or things like um, pharmaceuticals, but they don't belong in the garbage stream in the landfill. They also don't certainly belong in our recycling facilities. So first to talk about the waste transfer and disposal, this is about 90% of the agency's budget um, that covers the costs of transfer and disposal of the garbage that is put out by households. So all households in the Swank communities are collected by either a contracted waste hauler like LRS or are collected by their own municipal um, trucks. So uh, for example, Skokie has collection by their own municipal trucks. Uh, they all are required to bring the trash from our households to our transfer station in Glenview. That's the facility that's shown on the slide here. And when they get there, they dump that trash on the floor. We push it into a pile and then we load it with a grapple loader or an, a front end loader into a semi truck and take it to a landfill in Rockford. We take about 350,000 tons a year out of that facility out to Rockford. Um, but by doing that, we're taking fewer trucks than would go if we weren't using the transfer station. We can put three trucks or sometimes even four trucks of material into one semi-trailer to put it out to the landfill. Ultimately, our goal though would be to not send so much to the landfill. Um, we pay for this um, and our members pay for this through fees to the agency. And this year it's $51.30 for every ton that we take. On average, a household is going to generate about one ton per year. Um, so you, for your disposal cost only, not the pickup cost, the pickup cost is a lot more, but for the throwing away into the landfill, getting it to the landfill and um, placing it there is a little over $50 for your house this year. Um, and that goes up obviously every year. By comparison, recycling has a cost associated with it that right now is in the about $100 per ton range to process. But on the back end, there is revenue that comes in because it's a commodity that can be sold. So the cost of recycling, we always we talk about recycling being free or it's an add on service to our contracts. It's not technically free, but it does come closer to being a zero cost when we factor in that revenue on the material um, and certainly is cheaper than landfilling. So anything that we can do to get material out of the landfill is economically sound. It's also environmentally sound. We run um, a number of special material programs through the agency. So one of the things that um, we do, we work with the haulers and we work with the communities to uh, set up their hauling contracts for the basic materials that are collected from your curb every week. Um, but there are a lot of things that don't belong at the curb or that are needing special collection. So we have the special material programs that are listed on the slide that we operate. The years that are listed there are the years that we started those programs. Um, and the ones that are shown in bold and yellow are the ones that we partner with Wilmette as one of our member communities to participate in. So all of these are optional for our communities to host and participate in. Um, electronics is something that the village has chosen to do through a separate program under its contract. Um, and so it's not being used um, through our program. However, our electronics drop-offs that we have are still open to Wilmette members. So when we have our one-day events um, in um, Skokie and Evanston in Winnetka. We have a permanent collection during the April through November period um, once a week. You can come and use those collection points and it's all inclusive in your membership. It's just not something that Wilmette is hosting directly. Um, other programs that you're not participating in are the batteries and the household hazardous waste. Again, batteries is a program that was participated in at one point. Um, and was discontinued because there was a change in our contract. So we do not have a lot of communities that are participating in that program now. Um, and then the household hazardous waste, that's going to be a new program this year. Um, and we'll have a collection in Skokie at the end of July. So you'll be seeing more information about that. It will be by registration only, and it will be open to all Swank residents. Uh, so it is not restricted to just Skokie. So look for information on that in probably early June. 
A um, couple other things we do, um, I get involved in a lot of work at the state level and um, beyond the Northern Cook County area. We, um, I work with other counties and my counterparts at other agencies in the state to develop policy and legislation to help advance the um, waste management within all parts of the state and bring equity to all of our um, areas because we are very fortunate in this region to have access to a lot of markets for materials and to have a lot of um, support and funding from our communities to be able to engage in those special programs we're talking about. Um, other parts of the state don't have that. And we would really like to see that expand. And there is a need for safe management of things like electronics and like medications and sharps in other parts of the state. So we sit on statewide task forces, really a lot of discussion and study of policy and um, help frame policy. And then we get involved in legislation. And one of the big types of legislation now for waste reduction is extended producer responsibility or EPR. Uh, there's a statewide task force uh, or advisory council that has just been formed that is going to do a study of recycling needs all across the state. Um, and that's a, a precursor to a um, effort at packaging and paper product um, EPR legislation. We tried to run it last year. We got a lot of questions about what is it going to cost and how is it going to work. And the end goal with that is that all the packaging that we handle now in our homes a lot of it goes in the recycling cart. You know, it's your cardboard boxes and it's your bottles and um, all the things that are on this table are really types of packaging. Um, and some of it can't go in the recycle cart. But we as as local government and haulers are responsible for managing it at end of life and sorting it out and figuring out what to do with it and not knowing what's going to be coming down the pipe with the new design and packaging in three years or in five years. So LRS is making decisions about its facilities and what they're going to include for all of their equipment to sort out all of this material, but they don't know, they don't have a crystal ball of what the producers are going to put out there. So this would shift the cost to the producers to be responsible for helping to fund those systems and get it off the backs of us as local government. It's a much more cooperative relationship. We're already seeing it work with electronics. We just had our pharmaceuticals um, drug take back law roll out at the beginning of this year where the pharmaceutical companies are responsible for paying for the destruction of meds. Um, paint will roll out next year. That law was signed um, last summer and we introduced a battery bill this year. Um, so we are seeing a lot of momentum in this space and where this is where we're going to be able to provide continued service uh, to manage those harder to handle materials. So when we talk about recycling, I first have to step back and do that my little spiel on reduce and reuse. Um, because we want to really do those things first. The easiest waste to manage is the waste we don't make. So if we can think about our purchasing habits and if we can think about what we are bringing into our homes and make choices to reduce those purchases or to use less packaging in um, the items that we purchase and demand that from the producers, now we don't have as much to have to manage and decide where does it need to belong. Um, if we can reuse it through donation, through repair, uh, we're not putting it into the stream yet. And then we talk about the recycling and composting after that. And when we talk about recycling, and Joy is going to get into this a lot more, plastics are uh, the bane of the recycling conversation. We can talk about paper and fiber products are very easy to understand. They're typically always going to be recyclable through our MRF systems, provided they meet size requirements and um, you know that they're in certain condition. We don't recycle shredded paper, for example. That's the, an exception on paper, right? So if you shred your paper at home, do not put it in your recycle cart. It's like confetti and that's not a fun party to go to at the Murph. <laughs> um, so what we do say though, is we host our document destruction events. Wilmet partners with us every year to do a document destruction event. And that material does get recycled because it's going into a shred truck right there and it's only shredded paper in that truck. And it's in a volume that is sufficient to be able to recycle it. Now the use for shredded paper, those fibers get very short. So it's going into things like tissue paper. So it's not the highest return on use, but again, we're shredding confidential documents. We're making a choice about our privacy and security. Um, but plastics, they're hard because we hear a lot of things that are confusing and the, you know, one that we'll talk about and we are, have already had some discussion tonight is the chasing arrows and the number that's on the plastics. What do we, what does all that mean? We used to say all plastics one through seven, except for number six could go in your recycle cart. Is that true? Well, no, because three and four don't have a real good market. Um, sometimes there's certain ones that do. 
Um, the fives didn't used to have a great market. Seven is other. So if we're talking about what these numbers mean, they're just the chemistry of the plastic. It's what the polymer is. And how that actually gets put together into a package can vary within that specific polymer type. So number seven being an other, we're seeing a lot of um, compostable plastics, they're PLAs that are labeled as a number seven. in your cart. That's a sign of what type of plastic it is. What can be recycled are your plastic tubs, jug, tubs, jugs, jars, and bottles. Um, that's kind of the mantra that we preach. And Joy will give us a lot more examples when she talks. Um, we also hear that only 9% of plastic is recycled. Well, yes, that's what the data shows. But Plastic is in a lot more things than just the household materials that we think about processing to put into our cart. It's in our car parts. It's in medical equipment. It's in uh, all the different plastic bags and film and flexi packages that we see. Those aren't recyclable in our carts, but they are recyclable in other places. So we, again, come back to our buying choices and how we manage our materials and being responsible and getting material to the right place. And if we can avoid the plastic, all the better. And if it all goes to the landfill anyway, why would we bother recycling? We hear this a lot. It gets picked up in the same truck. Well, it might get picked up in the same truck, but it's going to a different facility. And I have this argument, even my own neighborhood Facebook page, and I, it doesn't matter that I say, I am the executive director of the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County, and I talk to 23 communities about this all the time. I'm not the authority because their neighbor's smarter than I am, because their neighbor knew somebody who once knew somebody else who drove a garbage truck. And they said that they picked it all up and took it to the dump. So there are a lot of challenges that we have to overcome, but knowing that you're doing good with the choices you make of what you put into your cart is a really great place to start. So we really value you all being here to talk about that tonight. Um, the last slide here. Um, so recycling is confusing and we have educational resources and tools that we offer that can help. Our website has a lot of information on it. We are actually going to be undertaking a website revamp um, through the rest of this year. So I'm excited to see what that looks like uh, when it rolls out. But on there, we have all sorts of um, guides and flyers of um, postings that you can put above your recycle cart at home in your kitchen. If you have people in the household who are really confused about what to recycle, it's got some great pictures on it to help them just sort it out for themselves. Um, we also do presentations like this. We're also in the schools very frequently making presentations to all grade levels. Um, we come out to fairs and community events and expos all through the summer. Um, we've got our school and library waste reduction grant program. So our library grant is new this year um, in the past eight months or so. Um, and we've done school grants for a very long time. Um, we are always happy to talk and share with folks um, about what they should be doing to manage their material. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joy. And we can talk more. If I appreciate all of your time. Hi, everyone online. Hi, everyone in the library. My name is Joy Rifkin. I'm a sustainability manager at LRS, Lakeshore Recycling Systems. Um, I'll just start with sharing that uh, sustainability is in our DNA. I think what sets us apart from other waste haulers is this immense prioritization around circularity. We're always investing in new technology, um, educational outreach and resources to make sure we're finding ways to um, uncover new markets and recycle as much as possible. Um, but we're doing more than that. Uh, we got a board approved net zero plan in September. So reducing our carbon emissions across the company, um, investing in electrifying equipment at our material recovery facilities. We just purchased a fully electric material handler looking at um, alternative fuels and really moving our company forward in a sustainable way. We have an early employment program. Um, that's Anthony and Adriana and her sister, Eva. They are studying to be diesel mechanics. They work with mentor mechanics. I could go on and on, but I know you're here to hear about recycling, um, but we do a lot of education and outreach and really take sustainability to heart. Okay, 
So what is recycling? Let's just go over the basics. So we go to the store and it's impossible when you're at the grocery store to not fill your cart with packaging, items that are either gonna go in your trash bin or your recycling bin. You put those items in the recycling bin and they're collected by an LRS truck. We go into your alleyway or to your driveway, collect those materials and take them to our material recovery facility. We call these MRFs. MRFs use magnets, screens, technology, people, robots to sort those materials and isolate them as commodities. So we can actually sell those materials to mills and factories so they can be turned into new products. Those new products get redistributed and hopefully the cycle begins again. So we're gonna talk about why this all matters, but really quickly, we're gonna to touch on curbside recycling in Wilmette. We know some people online are from different communities. So I'll just really quickly go over the schedule. So residential waste and recycling collection in Wilmette happens on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. If you get commercial waste and recycling services, so if you're in a large apartment building or a condominium, that can happen every day of the week, including Saturdays and Sundays. You have a leaf collection program. There's an e-waste collection event with registration required. There's a household hazardous waste collection event, registration required again. And then we do organics collection or food waste collection. Often you'll hear this called composting. For that, a sticker is required in the spring, summer, and fall. And you can opt into an organics collection program in the off season. We say that's like December to April for $120 for the full season, and you'll get collection once every two weeks. So we can talk more specifically about this schedule if you're interested, but I'm gonna get into why this all matters. So everything we use in our schools, in our homes, in our libraries comes from the planet. Paper is made from trees, metal is mined as ore, plastic comes from oil, and glass comes from sand. And these things are logged, mined, drilled, and extracted from our planet. And the more we connect the dots between what we use and where it comes from, the more we understand the natural resources we're conserving when we don't use products. It's also connected to climate change. Often when we talk about climate change, we think about burning fossil fuels in our transportation vehicles or our factories, but waste is inherently connected. If you think about the industrial processes involved in bringing this packaging to your grocery stores, creating this packaging, whether it's fiber and paper or plastics, it's getting transported to the places where we use those items or buy those items. And then we're disposing of it and trucks are on the road burning diesel fuel to collect those items, sort those items, run that machinery. And then landfills where we dispose of our municipal solid waste really contribute to climate change because landfills emit methane, which is a really potent greenhouse gas, far more potent than carbon dioxide. So when you choose to do the right thing with your waste or reduce the waste you create, you are actively combating the climate crisis. This is one of my favorite graphs. Hopefully those of you online and here can see the outline of the United States. This is a century of American garbage, a graph from the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. And you'll see the year is ticking upwards from 1913 all the way to 2013. The dots on this map are landfills. Landfills are giant holes in the ground where we dispose of our waste and it sits there. It's managed for thousands and thousands of years. Um, Red dots on here are open landfills, green dots are closed or capped landfills. And I think this graph does a tremendous job of explaining why we can't continue with business as usual. Um, some of the reasons that this graph has lit up uh, over the last decades is because of things like the invention of plastic. Plastic is incredible. If you look around any room you're in, you'll probably see over a hundred things made of plastic but it's also led to this world of consumerism and convenience. You get something, you use it for 10 minutes, five minutes, and then you throw it away. And plastic has led to that convenience mindset. This graph also looks like this because of regulation, which is a good thing. The EPA stepped in and said, we have to manage this waste. You can't just put it in waterways or burn it. We have to track where it's going and understand 
how it could harm us in our drinking water and our air. There are lots of reasons why this graph looks like this, but again, this is why we can't continue with business as usual and why recycling or reduction or composting or repair is so important. Another reason why this matters is the local economy. It really does benefit our economy when we do the right thing with waste. There are paper mills throughout Illinois, Wisconsin. We send all of our materials within North America. The only time we're leaving the United States is Ontario for some paper mills. LRS recycling facilities employ local residents in the Chicagoland area. Our drivers are unionized, making good pay, collecting that material. And then there are composting facilities throughout the Chicagoland area. Again, creating a product that they can market and sell. There are so many reasons why recycling is important, but I'll end with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 goals the UN has agreed upon to achieve by 2030. And when I ask young people, which goal is most important to you? Maybe it's gender equality, maybe it's decent work and economic growth, maybe it's sustainable cities and communities. And I ask them, can you connect that to waste in any way? They always can. And so these goals are interconnected, um, but waste is a part of this sustainable future and how we shape that future. So how do we recycle correctly? What we're all here for. So these are Swank signage. Um, you can get them on your website. They have them in, uh, in Swank's website. They have them in Spanish and English. I'm just gonna go over the rules quickly and then we'll play a little game to talk about what's recyclable and what isn't. And then we can look at some of the items that our residents have brought here. So we recycle glass, bottles and jars. Um, that's pretty basic. Anything that comes in glass that's a bottle and jar, you can put it in your bin. Plastic, we recycle rigid plastic, plastic that keeps its shape, bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars. There are some exceptions to that and we'll go over it, but that is the simple rule. If it's a bottle, tub, jug, or jar, and it's a rigid plastic, put it in your bin. Make sure it's empty with the cap on, throw it loosely in your bin, and we will be able to sort it and sell it. Metal, steel and aluminum. So cans, um, you know, something like a soda can or an aluminum tray with lasagna in it or a pie dish. And then those steel cans that we call tin cans. They might have chickpeas in them. They might have a juice in them, but those are absolutely recyclable. Metal is recyclable infinitely. So those cans can become cans again and again and again. We use um, magnets to pick up anything that's steel because steel has iron in it, so it's magnetic. We also use an eddy current for aluminum. That's basically a reverse magnetic field that the aluminum is repulsed from. So when it hits that field, it bounces into a different bunker. We recycle paper and cardboard. So paper can be recycled about seven times, each time the fibers are getting shorter and shorter. We don't recycle things like tissues or napkins. So you should never see a recycling bin in like a bathroom. Not only are those germy, but the fibers are too short and they just get skimmed off at that paper mill. But magazines, envelopes, cardboard boxes, totally recyclable. Oh, did I miss cartons? Yes, and cartons, sometimes that's a separate item. We recycle milk cartons, juice cartons. You might see rice milk in there. Cartons are paper, but they also have plastic lining and sometimes they even have aluminum in them. We send cartons to Mohawk in Wisconsin and they turn it into new food and liquid beverage containers. So here are some big no-nos. We don't want batteries, electronics, or sharps, any sort of needles. Again, there are special programs and we're so grateful to have agencies like Swank that can set up safe disposal. At our material recovery facilities, human beings are making sure that these items are getting recycled. So think about that when you're gonna put something in your bin. Is this something that could harm someone or hurt someone or contaminate the entire recycling load? This is my favorite rule. Soft plastic you can smash goes in the trash. If you can smash it, trash it. Things like plastic bags or plastic wrappers or crispy Doritos bags, they jam up our machinery. They're really tricky for us to deal with and they're not a strong market. So hypothetically, anything is recyclable, 
but can we sort it and can we sell it? And right now, soft plastic is just a huge burden at our material recovery facility. You can take it to a store drop-off, you can take it to a pharmacy, a grocery store, there are other options, but soft plastic you can smash does not go in your home recycling bin. We don't want food, liquids, diapers, shredded paper, Christine already went into that. Food, if you can compost in your backyard or with service, that's an incredible way to um, lower your carbon footprint and make a huge impact on your trash, um, but we don't want it in your recycling bin no clothing or shoes, and then no hoses, wires, cords, or hangers. Those, just like soft plastic, are really tricky for us at our facilities. Okay, so we're gonna play a little game. If you're online, um, send a one in if you believe this item is recyclable, and send a two in the chat if you believe this item is not recyclable. In the audience, I guess we can do the same thing. Hold it up, and a one if you think it's recyclable, a two if you think it is not recyclable. All right, our first item, a one or, oh, I've got a room of experts. <laughs> I can't see the chat right now, but the room, just everybody put up a one. You are awesome. This is HDPE plastic. It's actually the most profitable plastic we recycle. So if you do see a two on the bottom, even though we don't like to talk about that, twos are very, very recyclable. And we have a strong market for things like milk jugs. Newspaper, show me a one or a two. Recyclable is the one, two is not recyclable. Nice, nice, awesome. Again, newspaper, totally recyclable. Envelope, even if it's got that plastic lit, little like window thing, totally recyclable. Cardboard boxes, pizza boxes, one of the trickiest things. If it's soaked in grease, it is not recyclable. Because this is a room of experts, I'll tell you if the top is clean, Rip it apart, recycle it. But anytime it's food soaked with fibers, we don't want that in the recycling bin. All right, we've got a styrofoam cup. One recyclable, two not recyclable. I know my people at home are participating. Awesome, great job. So styrofoam, again, anything is hypothetically recyclable. We could take that styrofoam and recycle it, it's not a strong market. It's often contaminated with food or liquid and it breaks apart at our facilities. There are sites where you can go and bring your clean styrofoam and they'll densify it and then get it recycled. But no, in your home bin, we do not want styrofoam. Got some experts in here. All right, tin can, one recyclable, two not. I don't know if I've had a group do this well. Yes. <laughs> Steel, absolutely recyclable. We call it tin, but it's actually made of steel, that, magne that med magnetic material. So if you come visit our facility, a magnet will just pick it up and it'll sail away into a separate bunker. Okay, milk carton. Yep, awesome, great. And we always say that these items should be clean and empty. We work with Chicago Public Schools. We don't expect every student to wash out a milk carton. We do expect them to have a sink or a liquid pour bucket where if they have a lot of milk left, they're at least getting that milk out of there. So your stuff doesn't have to be perfectly clean, but it should be empty. All right, we'll do a couple more. Doritos bag. What's the rule? <laughs> Woo! Soft plastic you can smash goes in the trash. So things like a Dorito bag, a cookie wrapper, that is not the plastic that we want in our facility. Smash it, trash it. Aluminum soda can, awesome. Easy peasy, what about foil? You're right. So this is how I say it. If it's a, if it's a tray for lasagna and you've got the entire lasagna in it, please don't put it in the recycling bin. If it's pretty empty and there's a little sauce or cheese, that aluminum is going to be heated really, really hot and melted and re-rolled. So if there's a little residue, you don't have to be, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it shouldn't be full of food. Last one, apple core. This is kind of a trick question if anyone wants to answer. You could answer both ways. Anyone want to tell me why they said two? Yeah, yeah. So 
Awesome. Composting is a form of recycling. So please don't put this in your home recycling bin, but if you are a composter, that's another way to recycle this apple core. Great job. All right, we're gonna, am I way over? Okay. We're gonna talk about um, some commonly misplaced items. Oops, I'm giving it away. Um, we recycle plastic, rigid plastic, bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars. So I'm gonna go over a couple items here. This blueberry container, eat the blueberries please, or compost the blueberries, but that container is recyclable. It's a container, it's pretty rigid. It might, you might be able to crush it. Christina and I were talking about how some students are like, I can crush this and it's like, but it keeps its shape. It doesn't melt on the table. Next item, baby arugula. Again, eat that arugula, enjoy it, but that container can go in your bin. A vitamin container, rigid plastic, a container, yes, recyclable. Make sure no medicine is in there, no prescription pills, et cetera. A um, soap container, yep. And a dove container, yep. So lids on, even if that plastic is a different type. Our mills tell us, keep the caps on, we have ways to sort that, and those things can get turned into other products. So while a bottle might become a bottle, the cap might become carpeting. I will definitely take questions soon. All right, so this is the big thing here. Be careful with size and color. So something like a dental floss container, even though it's rigid, it's really small. Our facilities use screens and paddles. And a lot of times if it's two inches or smaller on any of those sides, it's gonna fall through the cracks and it's not gonna get sorted out. Yeah, there's a chance that that dental floss might make it through, but the odds are not in its favor. Toothpaste, this is, Tricky. Um, toothpaste is now being made out of HDPE in some brands, and it could potentially be recycled, but it's falling through our facilities. We're having a hard time talking the mills about if they want it or if they accept it. And I said to a couple Go Green Will Met members, we might be back here next year, and we might be telling you that we will accept it. But right now, we, we don't have a good way of selling and sorting that material. So two inches, it can fall through the screens. Another thing to be wary of is color. Dark plastics sometimes blend in with our conveyor belts. We use something called an optical sorter to sort plastics. That's an infrared camera. Based on how that infrared light reflects off the plastic, it can recognize what it is and trigger an air jet to shoot that plastic onto a different conveyor. When it's a darker plastic, it oftentimes blends in with the conveyor belt and isn't recognized by the optical. Also, darker plastics, they just don't go as a higher value at our mills. They're harder to recycle. If you think about clear, it's easy to turn a clear plastic into a colored plastic, but the darker the plastic is, the harder it is to turn it back into like a food safe product. All right, I'll end with, we are going to have a community open house at our state-of-the-art material recovery facility on Earth Day. The sign up for that will go live March 22nd, so one month in advance if you're interested. Um, we're also going to have a virtual tour of our facility coming out on Earth Day. So if you can't come in person, you can watch and kind of see how this stuff works. We'll also have new educational resources on Earth Day at our lrsrecycles.com slash recycling 101 website. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? Pass it over to Lucy. Okay, thank you so much, Joy and Christina. That was great. Yeah, feel free to come on up here. We'll be starting to do questions. Also, we realized the chat was disabled. So anyone at home trying to play the game, hopefully you just held them up to yourself at home, maybe to your pets. Um, a few other things before we open question and answer, just some Wilmet specific call out. So as Christina was mentioning, we do take part in quite a few of these swank programs where you can dispose of and recycle specific items. And the best way to keep up to date on that is either to subscribe to the Village's e-newsletter or to keep up with the Village's social media because we'll be posting about when those events are happening. And also to kind of keep in mind too is that we do some specific holiday related ones. So we also host a pumpkin pitch around the holidays. So hold on to your pumpkins until you hear about where the pitch dumpsters are at so you can have those composted. We also participate in the holiday light recycling, like Christina was saying. Um, and then 
During election years, we have yard sign recycling. So if you have any chloroplast signs, hold on to them until an election year and we'll have a dumpster in the back of Village Hall where those can be recycled. But now we will open it up to questions, both in person and from the Q&A. So we'll kind of switch off doing an in-person question and then an online Q&A question. Beth, if you wanna bring the, oh, you got one, perfect. Hi, you were talking about so two forms of recycling, the, the recycling of the old plastics and glass, but also the, the food scraps is recycling. Uh, for one thing, we it's included in our bill. The other one, we have to pay extra. We have like 30 addresses in our alley. And I once counted how many people do have a yard waste container. And I think it's only five. Wouldn't it be better to just include it for everyone uh, to keep it from the landfill because that's important. Uh, the woman from Cook County said earlier. I think that's it. I take that. Okay. Good question. You want to repeat the question? Did they he hear the question because it was Mike, or should I repeat it? Okay. We're all good. Uh, what was your name? Sander. Sander. Nice to meet you, Sander. Um, Sander asked a great question about organics collection. Um, I agree with you completely. I think my one pushback to that is that we have to put another truck on the road. So understanding that there's fuel use associated with that truck, that there's diesel emissions and carbon dioxide emissions associated with that truck, that there's a driver that's unionized driving that truck. And so for us, organics collection is an added cost. Um, if you can compost in your backyard or you have a community garden where you can bring those food scraps, that's awesome. I definitely agree with you. As it gets more popular, hopefully we get to a point where most of the people in your alleyway are doing it. And then we're like, okay, this makes sense to add a truck and just have that collection for everyone. I think when we first start out in communities, we have to garner that interest and then justify putting another truck on the road. Will the cost of organics pay for that truck? Does it make sense? How can we afford that and, and make it work in our business? So I would say for now, um, I'm glad it's an available service and I don't see it going away. I only see it becoming more available, whether that's at community gardens, drop sites or LRS servicing everyone. And I want to add just one thing to that and then we'll go to the next question is that we see a lot of contamination, things that go into the recycle cart that don't belong there and they get pulled out at a facility that is able to extract that and it's not causing, it's happening inside of a building and it's not causing an impact um, to our earth as, as readily. If we have the wrong things that go into the compost cart, then we are putting that into a compost pile and it is breaking down. And a lot of times it goes, goes through a shredder and it gets all mixed together. So if a plastic bag, for example, goes into an organics cart and makes its way to the compost facility and goes through the grinder at the facility. Now we have tiny snibbles of shredded plastic all through a compost pile. And we hope that we have a market for that compost being putting it right back onto our land and growing our food and our plants in it. So it's very, very important that what we do compost is very, very clean. And we need the people to um, that are participating in that program to really respect those rules. So it is still a little more in its infancy in terms of the universal nature of offering it because we want the people who are going to embrace it and follow the rules doing it rather than having it available to everybody to just get less trash in their cart and give themselves a pat on the back. One more add-on. <laughs> it's still more expensive to compost. Like land when we tip at a landfill, Tipping means emptying a truck. It's pretty cheap in Illinois. I used to work in New York City. It was far more expensive there. And so there was much more push to say, how do we compost? How do we recycle? It's still fairly affordable in the Midwest. There's lots of space. It isn't as far that we have to travel to get access to landfills. So I'm excited for when that cost switches and it becomes a lot more affordable and more um, sustainable to have that composting. But right now it's still more expensive. Okay, we've got a question from the virtual audience. We know from walking through our alleys that many people put their recycling into plastic bags. We know that's bad. We can't keep doing that. But somebody said, what if I like to put my recyclables in a brown paper bag? Does that screw up the works? I love Great question. You can absolutely put your recyclables in a brown paper bag. 
That is wonderful. The big thing here is that we at the material recovery facility need those items to be loose. And when they're in a loose brown paper bag, it gets tipped and then they're all loose in the facility. The problem with a plastic bag is opening that up. And if we can't see inside, our staff is not going to rip open that plastic bag. And so definitely, if you have an extra brown paper bag, put your recyclables in there. As long as they're able to tip and get loose, then we will be able to sort and recycle them. And don't cram them into your cereal box because they won't tump out nice and loose. And I had to retrain my family on that, that you do not shove all the cans into the cereal box and put them all out there because it's convenient to carry it that way. So it, because it won't dump out. So if you do that, it's great to get it from the kitchen to the cart that way, but dump it out at your cart because we can't do it with everybody's boxes that come in at the market. Any in-person questions? We can, yeah. Okay. That wasn't and now it is. Yes. The question. Yeah, the, paper cup. the question was, what about the paper coffee cups, that like the to-go cups? I'll jump in on this one. So the the paper co cups now, they're recycling is dependent on markets, and the availability of someplace to send a material is very important in its recyclability or our interest in recovering it. So there did not used to be a market for those cups. A lot of cups had a plastic lining to them or a wax coating to them. And more companies now have gone to a um, more of a single plastic or single paper um, or multi-layered paper that does not have those additives or the mills are able to separate any of the plastic that is there when they send it through the process. So with a lot of work with the different MRF providers and making sure across the region that they were all able to find markets for the cups and that their paper markets weren't being harmed with the cups, we were able to add that as a recyclable material. Um, we currently are not saying polypropylene cups, your you know Starbucks uh, cold cups or your McDonald's cups, those are not being listed as being accepted yet, but the equipment at the MRF sometimes does see them if they're coming in and will capture them. But until we tell you to put them in, try to keep them out because it is, again, one of those areas where it can impact the function of the MRF and it can impact the market for the material. Um, but I do expect we'll be seeing that pretty soon. Um, again, if we come back in a year, different material. Basically, it's like all paper cups are okay now. Yeah. Paper cups are okay. Take off the lid, take off the straw, and but yeah. Yeah. Because those mill the mills, it's it's such a small percentage of what goes into the bale of paper that the mills now have said they will accept it and they can work with it and it doesn't degrade the paper. Lids and sleeves. Lids and sleeves. Uh well, sleeves can stay. Lids are out. So pop the lid off, make sure that you dump any liquid out before you put it in the cart. Going back to the lids, like if you have a metal lid on a glass jar. Yeah. It doesn't, and does the size before like the size matter if it was like Go ahead. Inches. So the size does still matter. Oh yes, so uh, the question was about, what about lids on jars? Um, like glass lids and a metal, uh, or uh, metal lid on a glass jar. Um, yes, keep the lid on the jar chances are that jar is probably going to break sometime in the process and now the lid won't be collected or connected to the glass. That's why the size is important. So if it's a, like say a salad dressing bottle and your lid is maybe an inch in diameter, probably throw your lid away. If you send it in with your bottle, the bottle's probably gonna be broken. It'll probably get separated. It'll probably fall through the sorting material, you know, it'll end up as a residue at the back end of the sorting line, but it doesn't hurt to put in because it is technically recyclable. Um, but it's one of those that you can choose uh, based on what your preference is. But on the larger jars, like a pickle jar, that lid is going to be captured as a metal and it'll go for recycling. Does it need to be on the jar or can you just throw it? When it's the larger lid, you don't have to have it on the jar. Um, the smaller lids, it's going to be more likely to be recovered if you do keep it on the jar. Even, sorry, I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. So the question for those online was uh, sour clean, like a sour cream container with the plastic lid, you know, those thin plastic lids, those stay on just like soda bottles, just like glass bottles. And we're going to do, I think we're going to do a question online. 
So one of the online questions, which was touched on, but I think we all still maybe aren't fully like there yet, is how clean does it have to be? My shampoo bottle, my peanut butter jar, how clean is clean enough? <laughs> it, it does not have to be perfectly clean. Um, I can sense that this group is really passionate and knows a lot and knows that recycling is better when it's cleaner. Um, I just think that we would rather get that plastic tub um, to recycle it with a little bit of residue than not get that at all. Um, but again, clean is better and that's better for our processing and our mills. If it's a jar of Hellman's mayo and it's full of mayo, please don't put it in your bin. That will eventually explode at the MRF. It'll be a big cleaning hassle for us. It will not be fun. But if it's a mayo jar with a little bit of mayo residue on the inside, you do not have to say, oh, I don't want to clean this out with a sponge, so I'm not going to recycle it. No, no, no. So your best judgment, I wish we could give you perfect answers. Recycling is tricky because it's always changing and evolving. The tech is always getting better. We're always finding new markets. But don't worry too much about perfectly, perfectly clean. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. The tops of tin cans. The tops of tin cans. So after you open it up with your can opener, what should you do with it? Yeah. You want to take that, Joy? Tops of tin cans can absolutely be recycled, made of the same material, that steel. If you can keep it attached to the three-dimensional tin can, that is a good thing. It helps with recovery. If you can't, don't worry about it. Put it in your recycling bin. Magnets will pick it up, and it should be recovered. Yes. Labels on, you know, take the labels on tin cans. I'm always taking labels. Okay. Off. So, how important is it for us to take the labels off cans and things? Yeah. So, they're shaking their head. No, not important. Can I add one thing? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, labels do not need to come off. Um, but if you ever see a plastic bottle, like, have, has anyone seen Nest Quick where it has a label covering the entire yeah. bottle? That is a problem for our optical sorters. The opticals are using infrared cameras and they're reflecting off of the plastic. It's gonna recognize that thin plastic that's covering the nest quick and it's not gonna recognize that PET that's under it. And so companies and package designers are starting to realize if they want to design for sustainability and recyclability, that label can't cover the whole bottle. Um, so notice that. Labels are fine. You don't need to take them off. But if it's a shrink wrapped label, Coffee Mate Creamer, that thing is so hard to get off. If you want that to be recycled, it's going to have a much better opportunity if that label is off and the optical can recognize the base plastic. And they're starting to put perforation now on some of them so yeah. that you can easily rip it off. And yes. And we have like Kraft Heinz came to our Murph. They brought us a ton of their packaging. We ran that packaging through and showed them yes, no, and maybe, and talked about it. So companies more and more are saying, we want to design upstream so we know it's going to get sorted and recycled. And so that's why things like this are so encouraging. It's like talking to the people doing the recycling, but also talking to the designers and packagers on the upstream so they can have that perspective as well. Okay. Just stay there and you repeat my question. Okay. Uh, what about the ever popular red solo cups? What about red solo cups? Um, Christina kind of touched on this, like Starbucks cups and cold cups. We don't really want them. The mills don't really prefer them. But again, if we came back in six months, we might tell you something different based on technology changes. Um, is that what would you add to that? Yeah. So the the red solo cups are. A different kind of plastic. They're actually number six. They're the same plastic that styrofoam is. They're just a rigid form. Mm -hmm. So that's the other part. So the I think the way that the rule will come out when we end up adding in plastic cold cups is going to be clear plastic. Yes. Solid or opaque. No, because it usually points to being a different type of plastic. Part of that's why we haven't told you to do it yet. Um, but yes, so red solo cup, party it up, throw it in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> 
What about uh, rigid, clear plastic cups that you often get served like wine in at an event? Rigid, clear plastic. A lot of times those are also a number six. So oh. if you're not sure, throw it in the trash. So we used to we used to say, if you're not sure, send it to the Murph and they'll sort it out, right? That was kind of the message. Recycle everything we can. And it created all this wish cycling. I wish that I could recycle this. So I'm going to throw it here and let the recycling people figure it out, right? The recycling people figured it out and told you that your bill is going to be higher because it costs more to process it and the value of the material has gone net, gone down. So instead of making it their problem, if you're in doubt, throw it out, right? Same as the, if you, if you can smash it, trash it, right? So if you don't know for sure, that's where bottles, jugs, jugs, tubs, and jars <laughs> is so important. It's very simple. If you get into the nuance and you know that more things are recyclable, that's great. But when you're talking to the general public, the people who are less invested in this, keeping it really simple and doing the really simple items really well is going to pay so much more dividend than trying to capture the toothpaste tube and the red solo cup and all of the other pieces that could be recycled maybe somewhere. Wish cycling. People love to think that plastic silverware can be recycled. Can you address that please? So wish cycling and plastic silverware. Plastic silverware is a, again, number six plastic. Typically it is a rigid polystyrene plastic. Um, or it may be a compostable plastic now. We have more um, compostable service wear that we're seeing. Um, it doesn't meet size criteria to make it through the MRF. It doesn't meet the material type to make it through the MRF. A lot of times it's going to be dirty. Um, so don't throw it away. Whenever we can, this comes back to reducing. If you have the means to be able to provide reusable service wear, that's going to be preferred. Um, if you are, we're working with schools to get more options into their cafeterias for reusable trays, for reusable service wear, so that they're getting away from their disposal heavy side. Their big impediment is dishwashers. They don't have, a lot of schools don't have dishwashers anymore. I'm sure that it's compostable silverware. I can put it in the, in my own If you, if it's compostable service wear, um, do not compost it in your backyard compost if you're back if you're backyard composting because your temperatures won't get high enough when you are putting it into your compost at the curb. The there are certain requirements that have to be met. Uh, it has to be it's not BPI certified anymore. It Composting is Manufacturers Alliance CMA. CMA certified. So there are different certification bodies that are out there that um say they've tested it in the different compost technologies to say that it breaks down at the right rate and to the right level of completion to be able to put into a commercial compost facility. So the composter that LRS uses uses a CMA standard. Um, and so it has to be marked CMA compostable. And again, if you're not sure, throw it away. Let me add two things. Yeah, go ahead. Compostable cutlery, um, something we ran into in New York City public schools is you can't have that much of it. You got to have the food. You got to have the carbon rich stuff to break down. And so when we're serving a million meals a day with compostable cutlery, suddenly our composting team is like, no, 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 no. We can't have this much cutlery. And so it is that balance. It also is still a single use item that takes a lot of energy to make. So just keeping that in mind, of of course, a compostable cutlery is a better option, but just reminding, can't have too much of that in the compost stream. And if you can use a metal fork, that's the best choice. I probably shouldn't have called on you. No, no, go for it. Okay. The size of paper, all paper is compostable, but is it, if it's too small, like a post-it note size, is that too small? Is there, is there something? No, in composting, it's okay to put small pieces of paper in. You could put shredded paper in your compost bin. Oh, recycling. Okay, then it does, size does matter. So like Christina said, and I'm stealing that line, that's not the party you want to be at at a MRF. The shredded paper if you think about us trying to recover that, it's just kind of blowing everywhere, falling through the cracks. So it is better to have an envelope size. Yes. Size. Yep. Hold it up for the people in line. Perfect. Like a little makeup container or a yes. little. Yes. But a business card is not. It could potentially make it through, but it will likely fall through the cracks. I wish I could say it explicitly, but it's this journey of conveyor belts and it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But yes, this is a good size. 
Okay, we're gonna do one more question from online and one more question from in person. We're, there's 34 questions in the chat, so we're so sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Our contact information is still shared on the screen. So if anyone wants to reach out specifically to Christina at Swank or Joy at LRS or me with The Village or Beth with Go Green, you're more than welcome to. And if you save those chat questions and send them to us, Joy, can, Joy and I can put together some responses. To okay, great. Anymore. And Christina just offered that, that her and Joy can help answer some of those questions we didn't get to. Um, so we'll get to our last chat question, which is what about those mesh bags that like avocados or onions come in? Are those recyclable? Mm -hmm. Can you smash it? <laughs> then you should probably trash it. That is a soft plastic. Even if it maybe feels a little rigid, it's going to fall into a different shape. It's also going to tangle up our machinery. So no, unfortunately, those are not recyclable. They can be returned at a store drop-off or a pharmacy um, if you're able to return those. And just speaking of those things that you can take to those drop-offs, it's not just your grocery bags. So your bread bags, your um, Amazon packages that are plastic that say uh, store drop-off on them, um, newspaper bags, anything that is a bag like plastic, Ziploc bags, um, all can go to those store drop-offs where they take your grocery bags back. That can go into so the the over wrap uh, or like the the plastic wrap film wrap around a bottle can go in your over wrap from like if you buy a case of um, Gatorade or anything that can go in um, all of those crinkly plastics. Now they don't want the pouches, so if it's a like a bag um, that's a flexible bag that's like at dog treats or that has peanuts or or the the York yeah. Like this type of bag, they don't they don't want these. It has yeah, it has to have some stretch and some flex to it. It doesn't crinkle. Yeah. 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 Cereal bag liners can go in. Um, those again, they're not really stretchy, but they do have they don't crinkle as much. So again, very fine line, very nuanced. But if you really are interested in recycling those, that's where they go is the store drop off. Still never in your cart. Okay, last in-person question. Yeah. I just want to know if Wilmet is ever thinking of setting up a, a styrofoam. I know they do it at Christmas, but Winneka does it every Monday. And I, if we could either partner with Winneka or Wilmet could set something up like that once a month for taking styrofoam, the hard styrofoam, and they take the food containers. And I do go there, but... Yeah, so I can... I yeah, so I can talk from a village standpoint. The collector that works with municipalities is currently at capacity. We've reached out to them to see if they were interested in other municipal sites, but they're they're not at this time. Um, there are some places that do more large scale drop-offs. Like you were saying, Winnetka has one um, primarily for their residents. Mount Prospect has one that collects from anyone in the state of Illinois because they received it from an Illinois grant. Mount Prospect is rather far um, for a bunch of people to individually drive. So we are trying to see if there's some potential for us to collect and then do more large scale drop-offs, but we're still working with them because they just um, got their densifier to be doing that. So there's nothing currently available to us. It's something we're really interested in, but there's nothing that from a municipal side that we could do. Did you want to add anything? No, you covered okay. it. Mount Prospect is a great option. It's, it is not convenient, obviously, as convenient as if you lived in Mount Prospect, but it is available to everybody. They do have limited hours. So it's on their website what hours they're open, but they do have to accept from anybody in the state. And ABT will take the- so They will take, the yes, they will take the packaging foam, but not the food foam. Um, and then there's also, if you happen to be headed down to the south side of Chicago, down at South Suburban College, there's a dense fire also. South Suburban College also has a dense fire for those online. Cook County Charm Center. Cook County Charm Center. So it's uh, Beth again from Go Green Met. I wanted to to thank our speakers and especially for those of you who don't know that Wilmet made the step to have a full time sustainability coordinator. Lucy Mellon has been a game changer in our community. We are so grateful to her. Um, also, if you've signed in from other communities, know that there are sustainable community based sustainability groups. Probably in your community, if you haven't linked up with them, you can find them through the GoGreenIllinois.org website. Um, I know you talked a lot about reducing. Um, this is something that we all can and truly must do. If you are giving a party, if if any group you're part of is entertaining, 
please help send the message. We just have to do this without making it all disposable. We can all be part of that. I was very excited about the extender, um, extended producer responsibility. That's really, really important because ultimately it should be on the burden of those companies that are making money off these products, not on us as individuals to do the right thing. Um, so those are the little pieces I wanted to say. I'm going to turn it back to Lucy. Just one last thing. When we post the YouTube, all of the questions that are unanswered that we can get answered, we'll put in the comments of the YouTube video, um, just so they're easy to be referenced uh, right there. So once again, thanks to everyone that came in person. Thank you so much to join Christina, our wonderful speakers that came here and gave us so much valuable education. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Have a great night. Thank you.